In this video, we're going to work through a question from our 2023 Mathematics Interview Question Bank. This question in particular was asked very recently at an Oxford college. If you'd like to learn more about the interview support we offer, including question banks, talk courses and mock interviews, do visit our website at www.vantageadmissions.co.uk. So in the first part of this question, we're asked to compute a derivative, in particular, to differentiate the function inverse tan of x plus inverse tan of 1 minus x over 1 plus x. Now, depending on where you are in your uh, second year differentiation material, you may already know the derivative of inverse tan of x. Even if you do, it's very likely that the interviewer would prompt you to figure that out. So let's, as a starting point, try to figure out the derivative of inverse tan, because that's going to tell me the derivative of the first term, and moreover, it's going to prove vital in the second term, where I'm presumably going to have to thread this result together with the chain rule. So the easiest way to differentiate an inverse trigonometric function is to use implicit differentiation. In other words, we don't know how to deal with the inverse tan, but if I take tan of both sides of the equation, y equals inverse tan of x, I can get rid of the inverse tan. So I see that tan of y is x. And now I can differentiate with respect to x. So on the left hand side, the derivative of tan is something we do know, it's x squared. But by the chain rule, I pick up a factor of dy by dx, because it's really a y, not an x inside that tan. Now, crucially, dy dx is precisely the derivative of inverse tan, because y is inverse tan. So we'd like that term to show up. The derivative of x is even easier, it's just 1. So that tells me that dy by dx, the derivative of arctan, is 1 over sec squared y. Now, although this equation's true, we don't really want y involved. I want everything in terms of x. Well, remember, we know that tan of y is x. And moreover, we know that sec squared is 1 plus tan squared. So the, this Pythagorean identity, 1 plus tan squared is sec squared, is really important when we want to convert between tan and sec. That is then precisely 1 over 1 plus x squared. So even if you know that result and you're able to quote it, we should be also prepared to prove it. Now I think we're ready to perform the derivative. The first term, the inverse tan, is obviously just going to differentiate to give 1 over 1 plus x squared. That's easy. As for the second term, I can just take 1 over 1 plus this thing squared. In other words, ignoring the fact that this is not an x. But then by the chain rule, all I need to do is multiply by the derivative of that rational function, which is sitting inside the inverse tan. So we're going to get 1 over 1 plus, now what was that? It was 1 minus x over 1 plus x, all squared, times the derivative of 1 minus x over 1 plus x. So this is coming from the chain rule. Now... That derivative there is nothing to fear. We can work it out very easily using the quotient rule. So we get the denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator over the denominator squared. And actually that's minus 1 minus x. Well, let's write this. Minus 1 minus x minus 1 plus x because minus minus makes plus. So that is simply minus 2 over 1 plus x squared. So if I return to this expression now, where I've got my uh, you know, unprocessed derivative, I've still got that first term of 1 over 1 plus x squared. And now this thing here, uh, I've still got. So 1 over 1 plus 1 minus x over 1 plus x all squared. But now this thing here we know is very straightforwardly minus 2. So I'll just put a minus there, turn that to a 2, and I've got 1 over 1 plus x squared. Now this is very welcome news, because at this point I can multiply through here, right? So I can let the 1 plus x squared hit each factor on the denominator. And what that leaves me with is when it hits the 1, I get 1 plus x squared. And when it hits this, it kills that denominator and gives me that. So we're certainly getting somewhere. Now I've got 
1 plus x squared plus 2x plus 1 plus x squared minus 2x. So these guys cancel and I've got essentially a 2 over 2 plus 2x squared. So then I've got this. And in fact, we get zero then as our derivative. So it turns out, therefore, that the f never has a gradient. In other words, it's always flat. So we shouldn't be all that surprised to see that the end result of the derivative was something, you know, intuitive, something that we can actually give an interpretation to. If it came out, I don't know, 1 over x plus 3 or something, it would be very strange if the interview question had a slog through a bunch of algebra without a sort of interesting payoff that we can then use. So now here comes that interesting payoff. So we now want to obtain a simplified expression for f of x. So presumably we can use the fact that we know it's got this really simple derivative. So let's recall what f of x was. It was inverse tan of x plus inverse tan. I must get the numerator and denominator right. It was 1 minus x over 1 plus x. And we know that this thing differentiates to 0. Now, if this thing differentiates, sorry, f prime x is 0. So if this thing differentiates to 0, by integrating both sides of that equation, I can see that fx takes a constant value c. In other words, all I get is an integration constant because the integral of 0 indefinitely is just 0 without the constant. Now, it's very tempting at this point to say, well, I now plug a point in. Let's say, for example, f of 0. x equals 0 is really easy to plug in because I get inverse tan of 0 plus inverse tan of 1, which is pi by 4. And then to say, well, aha, that means that the function is just a constant value pi by 4. We need to be a little bit cautious, however. The reason we need to be cautious is because implicitly when I do this, when I'm using x equals zero or any particular value of x to pin down the value of the constant, and I'm saying then if, it's that, if that's the constant that x equals zero, that must be the constant everywhere. I'm assuming that the function is not discontinuous. In other words, I'm assuming that the function doesn't do something like, say, this and actually jump in value at some point. Now, maybe that's a reasonable assumption. Generally speaking, our functions are going to be continuous. But let's study f in its original form very carefully. In particular, inverse tan of x, fine, that's continuous. But notice that the argument of the second inverse tan has an asymptote at x equals minus 1. Now, asymptotes are pathological behaviours. The moment we see a vertical asymptotes, at least. So already that should make us a little bit sceptical of our assumption that everything was going to be very nice with the constants. And let's think about this more carefully. What happens as I cross the asymptote? So if I'm to the left of minus one, so I imagine putting in something a tiny bit neg more negative than minus one, minus 1.0001 or something. Well, this is clearly positive because it's 1 minus a negative number. This is going to be a tiny negative number because I'm subtracting something bigger than minus 1. So I've essentially got positive over negative. So that means clearly that this thing tends to minus infinity. And that means the arctan of something which is minus infinity is going to be minus pi by 2. So that means that, you know, you can't really evaluate this thing at minus 1 because it's got a division by 0 issue, but arctan doesn't mind being fed something essentially infinite. So we know that as I tend to minus 1, this is going to tend to the constant value of minus pi by 2. But what about the other side? So if I look to the right of minus 1, so now I imagine I'm putting, say, minus 0 0.999 in something that's still really close to minus 1, but a little bit more positive. This is still positive because it's 1 minus something negative. So I've got positive, but now this has become a positive number 
because I'm actually adding something negative which isn't quite as big as one. So in this case, I've got positive over positive, which is going to mean that I'm going to plus infinity when I approach this asymptote. So that means that now my arctan is going to plus pi by 2. So you see, by careful consideration, perhaps motivated by the fact that we're rightly suspicious that something interesting will happen in an interview question, we've realised that this guy has a discontinuity at minus 1. It jumps in value immediately from minus pi by 2 to pi by 2. So what we can say is that as the second arctan is discontinuous at x equals minus 1, to find c, we need to use one value which is less than minus 1 and one which is bigger than minus 1. Okay, because strictly speaking, the value of c presumably will be different either side because looking at the form of the original function, it did enjoy a discontinuity there. So we've already seen by x equals 0 that this function is going to be just equal to pi by 4 when x is bigger than minus 1. And the reason for that is because 0 is to the right of minus 1, and I know that everywhere to the right of minus 1, I'm perfectly continuous, so it's not going to jump again. I'm only going to run into trouble when I try to look at something to the left of minus 1. Now, what simple value could I plug into the left of minus 1? Remember, we want it to be something for which we know the value of the arctans. Well, maybe taking the x to minus infinity limit will be easier. Because if I start plugging in minus 2 or something, I don't know what arctan of minus 2 is. Um, whereas, as I tend to minus infinity, I think we're okay. So the limit as x tends to minus infinity of f, well, arctan of minus infinity, so to speak, is minus pi by 2. And this guy in the x to minus infinity limit, these become negligible. So I've basically got arctan of minus 1, which is minus pi by 4. So that means that because it's got to be the same everywhere to the left of minus 1, including at minus, attending to minus infinity, we can see that as x, um, yeah, due to the x to minus infinity limit, this implies that f of x is actually minus 3 pi by 4 when x is less than minus 1. And of course, strictly speaking, the function is undefined at minus 1. As a quick sanity check, notice that the discontinuity we observed here from minus pi by 2 to pi by 2 was a jump of size pi. These also jump by pi, so everything appears consistent.